Hello and welcome to 30 on Climate, where you will hear some of the latest news on global climate change. My name is Bruce Lieberman and I'll be moderating today's talk. Today we're going to be talking about rethinking the political landscape of those who either deny that climate change is happening or that it's being driven by human activity. Joining me is David Victor, a professor of international relations and director of UC San Diego's Laboratory on International Law and Regulation. He studies how regulation affects major energy markets. He's written prolifically on climate change politics and policy, and he has called for a change in the way we think about climate change skepticism. David, thanks for joining me today. Well, thank you, Bruce. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Um, I want to begin by talking about some skepticism that was expressed by several viewers of 30 on Climate in recent days. And uh, it basically goes like this, that we will never be able to achieve anything approaching harmony in national discussions about climate change, specifically with those who argue that it's, you know, either not happening or it's not driven by human activity. Do you, do you have any optimism for progress here? Well, I think that harmony is too strong a standard. I, I think we, we don't have harmony in any area of major policy <laughs> change. We won't have harmony on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm concerned about right now is gridlock. I'm concerned that there are enough people who are opposed to policy change or don't frankly care much about the topic that you can't build a coalition that wants to get something done in this area. Um, and, and so and in that regard, I think um, the, the key for, for folks who want to promote action in this area is to demonstrate that climate is linked to other things that people also care about and also to demonstrate that this can be, climate policy can be adopted in a way that's not too expensive. Okay. Um. So you've written in, um, in your writing and speeches and in media interviews, you've talked about a more, this more nuanced understanding of so-called climate uh, change denialism. In fact, you say we shouldn't use that word at all. So why, why is that word such a uh, you know, misrepresentation? I think the term denialist um, is a very blunt term that is now being applied to peeps, people, a very small fraction of them actually deny the existence of the problem altogether. And a much larger fraction of them are folks who are either skeptical in one way or another of the, of, of the science or uh, concerned about the uncertainties there, or are concerned about the implications of taking these ideas seriously for, for what this means about the size of the government, about the extent to which government is going to regulate their behavior and so on. And, and, and there's a lot of what psychologists call motivated reasoning here, that I think what you see behind a lot of what has been labeled as denialism or skepticism is actually people who are concerned that the logical extension of believing all this science is that the government is going to take over their lives or this is some kind of a plot to, uh, uh, to by the left to take over the economy. And I think this is where the, the environmental movement and folks like myself and you and others who, who care a lot about this issue, where we need to, to show voters uh, that we can do something about controlling emissions in a way that still respects liberty, respects economic growth, and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I've just heard from my technical person that uh, viewers can see you, but maybe not me. But um, we're going to continue on because you're obviously the important one here. Um, as long as we have audio for me, um, then uh, we'll continue. So um, you've talked about uh, why that's a misrepresentation. And then you've also talked about um, which, um, you know, you've also talked about uh, these different segments, uh, the, the people who shill, uh, the skeptics and what you call hobbyists. And out of all these, which do you think poses the biggest challenge to um, advancing discussion, a national discussion on global climate change? I, I think, um, the, the, to me, what's the, the most interesting category are the folks that I call hobbyists. These are people who've spent a little time working on parts of the data, have developed their own opinion, right or wrong, usually don't publish any peer-reviewed articles out of this, but put this on the blogosphere, and then it kind of goes, goes wild. It's an interesting paper that's just come out in the last few months that's tried to map these links uh, around the blogosphere uh, to to uh, different different websites. It's pr uh, pretty interesting. Global environmental change. Uh, my own view is is that is that the the central political problem here uh, re remains what I call in some of my writings shilling, or remains people who are using the arguments about the uncertainty in the science to advance what are basically fundamental economic views, which is resistance to policy change here. A lot of the coal industry has been in this area. Um, uh, I think you see a lot of, of the far right uh, 
that are that are that are in this category where where frankly I think folks have been dishonest about uh, what the science knows and doesn't know, and they're hiding behind those uncertainties as a way to avoid uh, serious policy action. I want to talk about the shells for a minute. Um, you had um, you've written, and I've read uh, you've written that there's not actually an there's actually not a lot of money spent on shilling and that the business, you know, quote, the business of being a dissenter is pretty cheap. So why do you think Americans in particular make a pretty easy audience for those who spend money on spreading this doubt about climate change? Well, I think, uh, first of all, we don't actually know systematically um, much about the rest of the world. So some of this is, I think, a selection effect, that there's been much more research on the, the anti-warming movement in the United States than on the rest of the world. I think part of it is that uh, in Europe, which has been the area that has been most active on climate policy, um, uh, climate change is a much more shared mission, and in some sense is one of the biggest success stories of the European Union project, of the idea that individual European countries should work together on common policy. When you look at where they've actually been successful in doing that, climate is maybe the most uh, single most uh, most important example. And so I think there's there are some big differences between the United States and the rest of the world. I think that a chunk of what's going on is also English. What's interesting is that the, 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 the language of dissent and of skepticism and of hobbyism, uh, as I call it in some of my writings, that language is, is English and so the information is much more accessible to the average public than it would be in countries whose native languages are different. Do you think there's uh, something... I, oh, go ahead. Look at, at uh, you see a similar spread in other English language dominated countries. Uh, there's a huge skeptic com uh, community of people who are skeptical and, and active on the blogosphere in England and also a similarly huge community in Australia. Uh, do you think um, there's something about the, the truly American character that is, is maybe rebellious as a, a healthy skepticism for authority um, and government, especially government funded science perhaps, that's playing into this? I think it's, I, I, I think that's correct. I'm, I don't know if I want to pin that as a cultural phenomenon. I, I, I do think it is rooted in skepticism about the role of the state. And, and you know, this is, in particular, this is, a, I think, a problem for the Republican Party. The Republican Party is, is, is in the middle of some kind of wrenching changes, and I think nobody really knows how those are going to unfold. And the far right of the Republican Party has been the locus of a lot of this concern. You see this most recently in the comments uh, by Marco Rubio, uh, kind of raising questions about what, what we really know about any of the science and should we do anything about the climate problem. He's kind of backed off that in the last few days a little bit. But mm -hmm. that's a realization that in order to be elected in that party for a broad-based federal election, you need to be able, you need to be appealing enough to a, a growing, an increasingly influential and frankly wealthy part of the far right. Let's talk about skeptics for a little bit. Um, You've written that skepticism is really, you know, it's part of part and parcel of being a scientist, of course, and and that um, the skeptics community, um, as 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 you call them, um, includes a lot of scientists who are not climate scientists, but in in maybe another another field. Uh, and so my question is, how, how do you think scientists who are climate scientists can do a better job of communicating uh, with them, and then also to the public about where we know there is disagreement and where we know there's consensus. I, I think we're doing a lot in that area and we may be doing almost as well as we as we can be. You know, the, the profession of being a scientist is the profession of being disagreeable to some degree. It's a profession that 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 rewards, you know, within constraints, rewards um, disagreement, skepticism, uh, uh, nobody's won a Nobel Prize for just agreeing with what everybody else has said. And, um, and and that's a kind of built into the norms of, of, of science. I think the, science, the climate science community is very frustrated by all this because they see people who are outside their discipline trying to make sense of increasingly complex climate models or data sets and making what seem like simple errors. And it just drives folks nuts. Um, and I don't know what more can really be done there except to continue the practice of open, transparent publication and release and publication of data sets. 
Mm -hmm. I think one of the areas where the community of people who assesses climate science, um, for example, the most recent intergovernmental panel on climate change reports, national climate assessment, one of the things we've done very well over the last five to ten years is we've developed standard language and standard practices for conveying what we know and what we don't know. One of the concerns I have actually is that because a lot of these assessments are in some way or another approved either by plenaries of other scientists or by governments is that if anything they're biased in the direction of focusing too much on the things we agree on where frankly a lot of what worries me about climate science are the unknown unknowns if you like the, the possibility that sea level rise could be much more rapid than we originally thought there's been you know, recent evidence in that area Mm -hmm. uh, the possibility that there could be big changes in ecosystems that we don't really understand. And it's it's those areas where a lot of science is kind of working on hunches or something better than hunches that I think are actually one of the main reasons we should be concerned about uh, rapid global climate change. But a lot of that doesn't make it into the summary reports from these big assessments because when we look at what we really know in those areas, it's it's not much. It's more of a hunch than something where you've got robust evidence and lots of agreement. Well, let me ask you about um, that um news of rapid, the potential for rapid change, um, and then uh, news of things happening right right now. Well, we just, uh, you referred to that news report about um, irreversible melting in the West Antarctic ice sheet. Um, we have, uh, uh, you know, another fiery season in California right here in the San Diego area. Um, how do you think that kind of story resonates with the community of people in, in, in the United States and, and globally who do express some skepticism about about what's happening? Does does this do these kinds of stories matter? Um, I think this is actually a very important research topic because I think we really don't know the answer to it. Mm -hmm. I think for people who believe that this is a serious problem and are convinced we need to spend significant money dealing with the problem, we look at a story like the the, the evidence that sea level rise is going to be greater than we originally thought. We look at that evidence and we say there's another uh, piece in the armor for that argument and the case for doing something is stronger. Um, I think, though, we don't actually understand how the average member of the public responds to that information. There's some evidence that the average member of the public responds to this kind of litany of bad news about climate by saying, this is just too hard a problem, and uh, throws up their hands and says, you know, what can we really do about it? And that actually makes them more vulnerable to information about uncertainties and skepticism and so on. Um, I, this is an area where I think, uh, frankly, some some work between people who do polls and people who study human psychology would be enormously valuable because I'm I, I'm increasingly concerned that we actually don't understand how the public how the public responds to information like that. That um, uh, is related to a question I had um, also about uh, hobbyists. So, you know, you've written that this lack of belief in climate change is tightly correlated with a person's politics or faith in government. Um, and that part, and, and that this, you know, partly motivates um, uh, these so-called hobbyists. But shouldn't rational people be able to acknowledge the evidence of climate change and separate that from their skepticism of government's ability or competence to do anything about it? And and why doesn't this happen? I guess that's a, a, a an area for research. Well, I, I think actually it's one of the most important insights that psychology has brought into economics in the last few decades and, and several Nobel Prizes in economics have been awarded around this is that we're not actually fully rational. When humans make most decisions that we make, uh, at least significant decisions, we don't make with full information. We don't go out and re-optimize all of our choices. We have path dependence. We, um, uh, uh, we have bounded rationality in the language of Herbert Simon, who's a, somebody trained in psychology and economics and political science back in the 50s. And, and um, this is actually, I think, one of the most exciting areas of interdis inter interdisciplinary research in the social sciences right now. Uh, but, but I think the reality is that we should not expect the voters to be fully rational. And if we believe that policy in this area is being driven to some large degree by what the public ultimately wants, we shouldn't be at all surprised that they're swayed by lots of factors and not just kind of evaluating the evidence. They, people use cues. Uh, uh, to evaluate which evidence they really believe and which they don't believe. And a lot of those cues for the voters relate to ultimately back to party identification and, and their orientation around government. Okay. Um, let's talk um, uh, in the time we have left, about, about five, six minutes, um, about the latest um, AR5 reports, the uh, reports on, on 
global climate change from the IPCC. What what do you think are are you know taken as a whole this series of reports kind of the key take home messages are because you were a, a co-author on one of them. Yeah, so I was a convening lead author along with a very distinguished uh, Chinese economist for the opening chapter of the third of these three reports that came out over the last year. I think the overall message is a pretty grim one. The first report, which is about the underlying physical science, says basically we've become more confident in our understanding of the climate system, at least the fundamentals. Actually, in important areas, uncertainty has actually gone up, and a good example is sea level. And that's not because we become more stupid over time. It's because we've learned more. We've learned more about some of these unknown unknowns, like the possibility yeah. that the West Antarctic ice sheet might become mobile and melt more rapidly than people originally. A lot of people originally thought. The second report, which came out in March, says that the impacts of climate change are already being felt in some unmanaged ecosystems and are poised to get a lot worse. And the third report, on which I did a lot of work says that despite all the international agreements and policies in this area, emissions are rising more rapidly in the last decade than at any time since 1970, and you don't actually see the impact of those policies much on the ground. And the other thing we found in this last report was that it's technically possible to cut emissions to stop warming at global, stop warm, total warming at two degrees, which is a widely discussed goal. But I think the reality is that the, the policies you need to adopt to do that and the technologies you need to put into place very rapidly are completely beyond what any political system is going to do. And so I think one of the implications, although we didn't state it so bluntly, is that two degrees is over. You know, we're looking really at worlds where warming is more than two degrees. That's potentially much larger impacts, much greater need for adaptation. And even stopping warming at two and a half or three degrees is going to be a huge job. Well, it certainly seems like the focus of this round of reports or the, the tone of this these reports collectively was much more of a focus on adaptation, that we are heading into uh, a world that we need to start preparing for. Um, is that is that the sense that you have, too, of this series of reports? Yeah, that, I think I'd say that's one of the messages, not not the only message. That's, that's, a, that's an important message. And part of that reflects that the, there's the taboo I'm talking about adaptation is off. And, and that's um, because... I think until relatively recently, um, people thought, especially the environmental community, thought we couldn't talk about adaptation without somehow taking the pressure off governments to control emissions, as if governments can't walk and chew gum at the same time. But I think the reality is that we have to face on the face the reality that serious adaptation is going to be is going to be necessary. But the other big message from these reports is that stopping warming, even at something greater than two degrees, is going to require big reductions in emissions, like 50% reductions, and over 50, 60 years, the technologies needed to do that are imaginable, but they don't, they're probably not going to arrive automatically. Okay. Um, let's go to a couple of questions from the public. Um, one of them was, if you could identify which media outlets or, or reporters in particular do a good job when they are reporting on uh, climate change denialism. Are, are, are there media outlets or reporters who have a more nuanced view that we've been talking about? Yeah, I think, you know, I think there's a lot. Um, I, I have to say that I've been very impressed by probably the dean of that community, who is Andy Revkin, um, who's been watching these issues for a long time and has actually done several blog uh, posts on, on uh, his New York Times blog about denialism. And I think Andy, partly with the help of, of the late Steve Schneider and other people in the science community, um, has kind of realized that you can't just report, you know, both sides of the story as if um, any set of scientific facts or insights has, you know, two sides to it. And so I think he's had a particularly nuanced view about the role of denialists and skeptics and different types of, of uh, dissent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and um, another question here. Um, <laughs> It kind of uh, is evocative of what we talked about earlier. Do you seriously believe that being nicer will stop the CO2 lobby? Or is it time for scientists to push back more strongly, not less? Uh, I think the scientists are pushing back, actually. I think um, people have been fairly blunt about where they see the science, where they see counter-arguments as bogus and so on. Um, I think that's very important for folks in the scientific community to say what they know and be careful not to say things that they don't know or at least to clearly distinguish that because you know one of the values of clear scientific opinion is is the the status or the gravitas that comes from the fact that somebody's an actual expert in the field and um, I think that the scientific community as 
if they become more activist in areas where they aren't expert and where the ratio of opinion to fact is higher, that that actually could be harmful to the scientific community. So I'm not saying to ignore this problem, and I'm not saying just kind of be nice and hug everybody and smile and that's going to somehow solve this, but I think we have to deal with the reality that a big chunk of what we're calling denialism uh, is in fact uh, motivated by people's underlying beliefs either about their own commercial interests or I think actually more uh, uh, more pervasively their own beliefs about whether government can solve problems like this in, in, in a cost-effective way that doesn't harm liberty and so on. Great. Uh, well, um, we're right up at uh, 11.50 and I think we've had a brief but very productive talk. Um, David, thanks a lot for joining us today. No, and, uh, Thank you. Thanks. And for viewers out there, um, you can uh, watch this video almost immediately at the Yale Forum on Climate Change in the Media's YouTube channel or the 30 on Climate YouTube channel sponsored by the Yale Forum and also um, within the next couple of days, I believe, at the Yale Forum's website. Um, thanks so much. Appreciate your time and uh, we will see you next time. Thank you. Take care.